great day, Covenant family and friends. Welcome to this uh, week's uh, Just Jesus Bible Study installment, amen. Again, thank you so much for clicking on the link and watching us on today as we continue to take this trek through the book of Mark where we are looking at our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Let us pray. Most gracious, the eternal God, our Father, Lord God, we thank you yet for another day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, be with us as we turn back these pages of life. Have your way in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So here we are, in still in the book of Mark. We're in chapter 3. Last week, we dealt with chapter 3, verses 13 to 20. And this week, we got a big piece because we're going to deal with 20, uh, verses 20 to 35 to finish us out in chapter 3. Amen. So listen to this. Listen to this word. Chapter 3, beginning at verse 20. Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder the house. Surely I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may have uttered. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit shall never have forgiveness, but is subject to eternal damnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Verse 31, then his brothers and his mother came standing outside. They sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brother? And he looked around in the circle at those who sat about him and said, Here is my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. So listen, let's look at this and get into this. Amen. Um, so let's really just look at context first, right? Uh, Jesus begins his ministry with a bang, right? Chapter three, the chapter in this whole. He, he heals a man with an unclean spirit. Remember back in chapter one, uh, he healed many people at Simon's house again in chapter 1, conducted a preaching tour, chapter 1. He cleansed the leper. He healed the paralytic. He invited a tax, tax collector to follow him. He, he uh, basted the uh, Pharisees in a controversy about fasting. He was into that. Uh, again, the controversy over plucking grain on the Sabbath and healed a man with a withered hand. Perhaps most notably, when the crowds pressed around him at the side of the sea, unclean spirits fell down before him and cried, you are the son of God. In other words, it has been clear both to the crowds and to the unclean spirits that Jesus is working by God's power. Right. But as we will see, the scribes refuse to believe the evidence that establishes Jesus' godly credentials beyond any reasonable doubt, right? So that's kind of context as we close this chapter 3 out, right? Jesus has been busy from chapter 1 to chapter 3, right? Establishing his ministry. Remember, Jesus' ministry can be uh, categorized in three things, right? Teaching, preaching, and healing. And we just saw from chapter 1 to now ending chapter 3, we see that. He's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing. So, but let's look at this text, verses 20 um the 35. The first thing is verses 20 to 22, right? He has Beelzebub, right? Right. The multitude came together and saw that they could not so much as eat bread. 
when his friends, right, uh, heard it, they went to seize him for they said he is insane. <laughs> right. So what that says, right, Jesus is doing the will of the father. There's folk around him that don't understand. They say he's insane. The multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. Mark reports this kind of enthusiastic response to Jesus over and over again, right? And he says, with his friends, heard it, they went out to seize him. While the Greek does not specify that the people attempting to restrain Jesus or family, right? The NRSV or the NIV translated translate that way because of the mention of Jesus' mother and his brothers in verse 31, right? But we it says her friends instead of family, but family is probably the better choice, right? For they said he is insane. Jesus' family has not decided on his own that Jesus has gone out of his mind, but has instead heard the reports. See that, right? His family hasn't ex experienced anything with him being so much out of his mind, they heard somebody else say it. They heard the reports. That's why they're always saying, whose report will you believe, right? Right? And so they go to Jesus intending to restrain him, but have not yet had the opportunity to assess the situation for themselves. While we can understand the family's concern, what family wouldn't be concerned about the reports of a family member's emotional breakdown, right? The present testifies to their lack of belief and serves to undermine Jesus' credibility, right? Remember what we just said from chapter 1 to now. He's been going through teaching, preaching, healing, casting out demons. And watch this. Here comes a family member questioning. He must be crazy because we heard it. Haven't experienced it, but we heard it. So be careful who's in your circle, even when it's family, right? They go so far to even name the demons that he's in cahoots with, right? He has Beelzebub, and by the prince of the demons, he cast out demons. See, Beelzebub may be a variable a Beelzebub, right, back in 2 Kings, or may mean Lord of the flies or Lord of heaven, right? In any of it, the scribes or accusing Jesus of accomplishing his miracles by the power of the ruler of demons. See, people start lying on you and, 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 and all that. Why are you doing the work? They are seeking to discredit him in the eyes of the people by planting the idea that Jesus is working by Satan's power instead of God's power. That's what's happening there in that text, right? And we should not lose sight of the fact that the Pharisees, with whom the scribes are closely connected to, has recently decided to destroy Jesus. Go back and look at uh, chapter 3, verse 6. This is the first attempt to do so, right? They made that claim back in, uh, in verse 6. This is their first attempt to do so. If the scribes can succeed in making the chain stick that Jesus is working by demonic power, they can bring legal action against him, right? They, they can set the claim up, right? There's always sometimes some folk uh, and spirits that are happening behind the scenes that's trying to make the claim that you are not who God has meant you to be. Amen? So that's the first one, right? He has Beelzebub, right? That was chapter, I mean, uh, verses 20 and 22. And now let's look at verses 23 to 27 because now we get into some the dialogue, right? How can Satan cast out Satan, right? He says, how can Satan cast out Satan? Like most lies, the scribes charge that Jesus is working by uh, demonic power sounds plausible. It really does. When you think about it in context, most people hearing such a charge will begin to wonder, how can Jesus defend himself against such a charge? No evidence has been presented, so there is no evidence to refute. Such a charge would not, uh, such a charge would stop most of us in our tracks. What could we say in our defense? Right. But Jesus quickly exposes the logical fallacy at the bottom of the charge when he says, right, look at Jesus. This is if you have the right Bible. Right. It should be in red. Right. Look, look what Jesus says. How can Satan cast out Satan? That's what he says. He asks. Right. Verse 23. For Satan to oppose himself would be self-destructive and would be the beginning of his own end. Right. So Jesus is Jesus uh, imagines 
uh, of a house divided against itself and Satan rising up against himself fully il illustrate the suddenly obviously fallacy in the thought that he's working with demons. Y'all get that? See, there is a lesson here for us, though, really. How can we accomplish good ends by evil means? See, the world has often given a ready answer, easy. But the whole course of history has supported Jesus' affirmation that cannot be done. Evil will always produce evil. Amen? But then he says, but no one can enter the house of a strong man to plunder unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder the house. See that? How can Satan cast out Satan, right? We dealt with that, verses 23 to 27. We dealt with he has Beelzebub, uh, verses 22, verses 20 22. And now let's look at verse, verses 28 to 30. Here we go again. Whoever may blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Right, and he starts this off by he he transitions from uh, uh, a really killing that he's working by demonic spirit, and then he goes into watch this. Look look at the language. Most certainly, I I tell you, or most assuredly, I tell you, these words signal the listening that Jesus is ready to make an important uh, pronouncement. Uh, they say, listen carefully. Jesus uses this phrase frequently, right? All And look what he says. Most assuredly, I tell you, all sins of the descendants of man will be forgiven, including their blasphemy, blasphemies which, which they may blaspheme. Jesus is, is about to pronounce a heavy judgment, but he first affirms the possibility of grace, Right? We can be forgiven not only for sins against other people, but even for blasphemy, sin against God. It is blasphemous to use God's name uh, wrongfully in violation of the commandment. Go back and look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 for that. See, it is blasphemous to show contempt for God or to curse God, right? And so he's setting them straight. He's really giving them a lashing here, a spiritual lashing. Of, of accusing him or bringing to him something uh, that he's working with demons here, right? All right, got that? So let's go back, see where we are. We're about to close. Verses 20 to 22, he has Beelzebul. He deals with that. Uh, verses 23 to 27, how can Satan cast out Satan? And then we looked at whoever may blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Verses 28 to 30. And now let's look at verses 30. 1 and 35. And I want I, we're gonna close here because here it is, right? This is to me one of the greatest examples in the gospel of Jesus exuding uh, or lifting up this idea that I think is so important to the Christian faith today. Is this posture of counterculture. Listen to this. Verse 31 and 35. Whoever die, whoever does the will of God. Watch this. His mother and his brothers came, standing outside, they sent to him calling, right? It is significant that Jesus' mother and brothers are standing outside alongside Jesus' opponents. His family is standing against the scribes, right? Right? In the, in the next chapter, you will see Jesus will explain uh, his use of parables by telling his disciples, to you is given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest perhaps they should turn again and their sins should be forgiven. You're going to see that in the next chapter, in uh, chapter 4, verse 11, 12. But the fact, also it's something to point out too. He says, who are my mother and my brothers? Right, this counterculture. This sounds very disrespectful, right? Very disrespectful. You think about this, as if Jesus has disowned his mothers and brothers, but that is not the case. Jesus does not ask this question to exclude his mother and his brothers, but rather to set the stage for expanding the concept of family to include all those who do the will of God, right? Can you imagine that, right? He's sitting in the room. Someone comes to tell him his mother and his brothers are outside. 
right? And he ignores them, right? Uh, Jesus acknowledges elsewhere, however, that faith requires disciples to put God above family and sometimes results in families divided over the issue of faith, right? Faithfulness to families is important, but faithfulness to God is more important, right? And then he says, he, he remember this picture this, he's in his room, mother, mother and brothers are outside. Someone comes in and tells him that they're outside, and then he turns around, the scripture says he looks around the crowd in the room, and he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. The word whoever should encourage us. It makes no difference what color of our skin, our social economic status, or our nationality or, or gender. Jesus doesn't even exclude drunks or prisoners or the 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 or neither the do-gooders, right? Or those on the margins. He doesn't exclude anybody. All who do the will of God are automatically enthroned or enrolled in Jesus' family circle. And that's the blessing, right? Counter culture. You would expect him to go out. Somebody go get my mother. Give her my brothers. Give them the great seat in the house. He does not, right? He expands the ideal of family or, more importantly, the house of God. Just Jesus. Amen. So here we go. Just Jesus, we dealt with verses 20, 20, chapter 3, verses 20, 22. He has Beelzebub, right? And then verses 23 to 27, how can Satan cast out Satan? And then verses 28 to 30, whoever may blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. And then verses 31 to 35, whoever does the will of God. Just Jesus Amen. I pray that this lesson has blessed you and uh, encourages you to study this word even more because it gives life. Just Jesus. Let us pray. Most gracious, the eternal God, our Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time of your word, God. We pray uh, that it illuminates our heart, God, that we might stand and live out this word that you so graciously gives us, oh God. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Until next time. Remember, just Jesus. <laughs>